it was a nightmare. He'd been hit by a car. I found myself in a hospital waiting room that had a couch and a fridge in it. And that's when I knew we were in trouble because uh, you always get those comforts when you're about to be given bad news. I remember it from Connie. So I said to the nurse, you're going to tell me he's going to die, aren't you? And she said, yes, it's very serious. Uh, she started talking about uh, bringing you out of an induced coma um, with very low expectation of success. Uh, and she came back an hour later um, with a happy, surprised look on her face and said, he's awake. Uh, yeah, so I breathed a sigh of relief. Yeah. I nearly died. You did. Um, I don't know what happened because it's true. You know, you see the guys on, on TV, they're like, um, I blacked out, I don't remember anything. <laughs> it's a real thing. Um, it happens like legit. You don't remember it. It's not like it's suppressed and you'll remember it down the road when, when you're less affected. It never gets memorized. As soon as you get a, uh, an injury to the, I think it was the frontal cortex or something, uh, uh, the frontal lobe or something like that. As soon as you get an injury to that part of the brain, um, you don't remember anything like literally the memories never get stored and never get so i'm not repressed or anything i just can't remember it and i'll never remember it because it was never backed um so what so where were you what happened well i was at home my phone rang sam's been in an accident uh so i just remembered everything dad always taught us you know don't do any when, you, when you're stressed don't drive so I remember taking a few breaths, thinking, just stay under the speed limit. It's all going to be fine. You've got to get there safely or you can't be there for him. So I drove the speed limit. And just as I was coming up Punt Road towards Commercial Road to turn right to the Alfred, uh, I had to stop because there were lights and sirens. And there was a police car, a mica, an ambulance, another mica. And I thought, that's Sam. So I just stayed behind them. Uh, Turns out they don't go as fast as you think. Um, and I pulled into the emergency bay. Um, the ambulance went around the back and I ran into the hospital and I went to the nurses and I said, that's my brother. You know the reason why they don't go fast? So they don't have an accident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so the patient stays on the bed. Yeah. It doesn't fall off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was you. But they go fast too, the accident and slow from. Yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, I'm putting words in their mouth. I, I, that, that's my position yeah. anyway. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember anything. Yeah, so we got, to the, we got to the hospital at the same time. I didn't know that. Mm. Do, um, you remember, do you remember the leading up? Um, no, I just remember being in a car with a friend going to my cousin's uh, for dinner. Um, and it was a long drive. I'd been like, it was like a three hour drive and I was bursting at the seams. I needed to uh, pay, needed to do a wee. And um, I still had half an hour of driving to do and I was just not going to make it. So I got out of the car to do a wee and I woke up two weeks later. Yeah. Um, so I, I have no idea what happened and no idea, no willingness to recall it either. Firstly, because I know that I don't have any memory of it. But secondly, I just want to look forward. I don't want to, uh, you know, I mean, I feel for you because you had to deal with everything that, like the whole two weeks uh, after the accident, you had to deal with that. And I don't even, I won't remember a thing. Yeah, well, when you're in intensive care, I remember walking in, you were battered, banged about, you couldn't see you couldn't say more than three words in a sentence and it was in a Russian accent and I had to brave face and just pretend everything was okay and talk to you as though nothing had happened. Um, so it was quite difficult because we've always been open and honest about everything and there I was sitting there, you know, pretending that everything was fine when it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't do anything. So I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. Yeah, that big neck brace I on. I had a neck brace on for, for a long... Do you remember Do you remember the neck thing? Oh, yeah, because yeah, I walked in one morning and I said, how are you today, Sam? And you said, Sam, very bad man. I was very honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said, Sam, run away. Oh, no, I wasn't running away. They all thought I was running away. I was actually chasing the neck thief. Um, the neck thief had come for my neck brace out of all of the patients in the hospital. 
uh, it, it somehow clapped its eyes on my neck brace and it had stolen the neck thief had stolen my neck brace twice and went to run off with it and so I went to give chase to the neck thief and people thought I was trying to escape and uh, all I remember is that I was crying on the floor about the neck thief <laughs> and there was like a um a neck brace just a meter and a half away making me look really guilty of course <laughs> and so everybody believed that I was the neck thief and I got very upset because nobody everyone thought I was the thief and that I was trying to run away and all I was trying to do was regain the equipment that the hospital had lent to me <laughs> So basically, you go through PTA, which is post-traumatic amnesia, um, which is really common amongst people who have had a, any kind of brain injuries, and you end up loopy as. And, I mean, I had a Russian accent. I, uh, I mean, the neck thief visited, and I was the neck thief. Um, <laughs> do you remember the donut machine? Oh, God. So every day I came in, and I'd say, you need to have this MRI because we need to see the results and see how you're going and we're not going to be able to move forward, you know, because all you wanted to do was get out of there. And I kept saying, well, we can't move forward to the next step unless you have your MRI. And you'd say, yes, I'm going to do it today. Yes, I'm going to do it today. And I didn't understand why you wouldn't hop in the machine. Well, I'll tell you why. They, they tried to turn me into a donut. I didn't know it was an MRI machine. They didn't I didn't have know that big round. I mean, it's yeah. a scanner according to any naked eye. Like, you'd go, okay, that's an MRI, MRI machine. <laughs> um, but I was convinced that it was a donut machine and that every doctor and nurse and person that operated that machine was trying to turn me into a donut. And I was a cancer man. Yeah. Like, how dare they turn me into a donut? I'm just getting started on this cancer business. I was, I was really offended that they saw some kind of donut potential in me when I just wanted to get well again and to work on cancer. There was a major misunderstanding about the donut machine, which in fact was, was the doctors and you with the MRI trying to nurse me back to good health. And when you were coming out of the loopiness and you were aware of it, that's when I knew. And they must have known because that was the countdown to coming home. Yeah, you remember the doctor that we used to meet with? He, he saw yeah, the he oh, did. No, no, I, want to, I want to use right now. To thank everyone that put me back together. Yeah. Vic Pohl, the Ambrose, the people at, at the Alfred, and uh, of course the Wizards at the Epworth. I was, uh, <laughs> I can't buy, I mean, I had no idea. Yeah. I, I just had no idea just how many people get into accidents and how long the road to recovery is and how serious it is when your brain gets knocked. Yeah, well, that moment, the moment we came home, that was pretty special. Six and a half weeks. Yeah, yeah. It took you a while to get up the driveway. It's like a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a mountain, it's just a driveway. But, yeah. Uh, it was like I climbed a mountain just just getting... And I used to check for... I don't know whether you know this, but I, I checked for traffic um, inside. Yeah. I was super paranoid. Yeah. What I called Pazza because I tried to laugh at how careful I was being. So um, Pazza is short for paranoid. But like I was super paranoid. I mean, I had this crafted for me and smuggled in to hospital so that I could... Touch wood when I said touch wood, and I said touch wood a lot. Yeah, and you continued to do it after you got home. Yeah, but coming home wasn't all roses. Um, you know, there were ups and downs, and no, just because you're home doesn't mean you're better. Yeah. And it took, <laughs> it took a while for me to realise that and sort of settle into the forwards, backwards yeah. um, sort of part of caring and trying to keep that hidden from you. You know, you're. What do you mean? Well, any carer would know this. You turn around to make the toast and that's when you can have your emotion on your face and on your insides and you turn back around and, um, you, you know, again. smile and positive and optimistic because everything's great. Um, uh, yeah, so it's not, it, wasn't all, it wasn't all roses coming home. Um, uh, but those, those first few weeks, it's just been getting better and better and here we are. You know, Connie used to say that it's harder for the people who care for me than it is for me. Yeah. She used to say that. And I used to be outraged. I'd be like, well, I'm disgusted, but I don't have cancer. <laughs> you know, like, and I, I always saw her as the center point for the pain. But, mm. but, but she yelled back loud and clear over and over again. No, no, no. no the, the, the carers, they're the ones I worry about. And I suppose I had her voice echoing in my brain. Yeah.
I, I looked at these before our chat, and this one is uh, apparently of me when I when you knew that I was going to be okay. Oh God, I remember that photo. I remember thinking how good you looked because this was a, a week later. And I took this photo because I was doing daily messages to family and friends, updates. And I remember sending this photo thinking they'll be so pleased to see this photo. Um, and in hindsight, you actually don't look that good. No. Uh, but comparatively. Compared to what, compared to what you looked yeah. <laughs> at yeah, the people start. people like you could have sent me a warning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was taken the day before you moved from the Alfred to the Epworth. Well, most, most, most of my injuries look healed. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But I was pretty bunged up. I mean, I got hit by the car on the right side. My whole right side was cactus, my head, my neck, um, my my lung. I, I'd, I'd inhaled um, ground glass. Yeah, when you hit the, the accident screen. or something. Yeah. Uh, the hip, the knee, the ankle. I mean, everything was cactus, but basically over the last three months, and it's just been three months, that's why we're allowed to yeah. do this chat, yeah. is because I'm past the three-month period. But basically, I was really bunged up. Yeah. Um, I can't uh, I can't underestimate how injured I was, as, as good as I feel now. Yeah. What were you working on before the accident? Um, so, I did bring it. Can I? Am I allowed? Yeah. It's not too silly. No. Nah. I was meant to release a book right when I got hit by a car. My life and other catastrophes. My life and other catastrophes. <laughs> when the marketing kind of does oh God. itself. It? <laughs> um, basically, I nearly died catastrophically yeah. right when I was about to release a book called My Life and Other Catastrophes. And it's a true and honest account of the actual me. So it's like a journal that you fill out with your memories and who you love and what you regret. And basically, it's a, it's a little who you are book. And uh, people can get it now if they... Jeez. Well, now the worst is behind us. What's next? <laughs> Give me a minute. I've still got some jobs to do. Like I don't. My specialists haven't even started teaching me how to like throw or jump or run or walk backwards yet. Um, so I'm focusing on my recovery, but I'm also focused on maybe writing a one man show. I've, got, I've had Pete Elliott tell me that he'll help me. Um, so hopefully I'll come back bigger and better than ever um, out of this. But I do want to acknowledge everyone who put me back together. It was the Vic Pyle, the Ambos, the people, the Alfred and the Epworth. And it's not just the doctors. I'm talking about the orderlies. I'm talking about the cleaners. Like everybody who visit, visited my room was um, just a wizard, uh, and all of them. So I wanted to acknowledge them. But also I woke up and my charity wasn't dead. My big sister was still alive and people yeah. were still furious about what cancer had been up to. And the regular givers had kept us alive while I was wobbly. So I want to acknowledge them and any villagers that have sent us a ton of well wishes. Yeah, that meant the world to me. Yeah, the time. Um, certainly, uh, certainly a tear or two was, you know, yeah. uh, fell yeah. as a result. Um, so thank you to all those people. But thank you to you, <laughs> mostly, you know, because you were there for me every day. And and it's been i think nearly 80 days and yeah thanks for holding my hand mm -hmm.